Good evening, and uh, thank you for joining us for the RSCAN webinar, Using of Robotic High Frequency Ultrasound in Glaucoma Refractive Corneal and Oncology Patients. This uh, webinar is um, performed or done uh, for the ophthalmic so photographer society. So thank you to them. My name is Rick Behrens. I am an optometrist and uh, I live in Australia, Sydney. Uh, I, trained my, I trained in Venezuela many years ago. I did a lot of uh, optometry, clinical optometry there, especially with contact lenses, rigid contact lenses, not the easy ones. And I was a lecturer in the university there. I migrated to Australia in 2004. I worked for SIS, mainly with OCT's microscopes, uh, IUL masters. Now I've been worked for a distributor here that used to sell Topcom um, lasers and uh, sorry, Topcon OCT's and uh, Quantel ultrasound devices. Um, a few years after, 10 years ago, I started to work over 10 years ago, 11 years ago, I worked with a company called Elix. They manufacture lasers and ultrasounds. Uh, there I did an array of different um, jobs. Um, seven years of those were with a star surgeon. Um, I was the senior proctor for Australia and New Zealand, um, managing uh, the training for a lot of different uh, doctors in, in the region. But I also did a lot of training with ultrasound uh, around the globe, and uh, especially in the, um, once I became the vice president of sales, I was also uh, looking after training in the whole region. So um, I had the opportunity to train a lot of users in the, in the ultrasound techniques, which was a great experience. Today I work for a Meridian Medical. It's uh, my um, um, Swiss, Swiss laser company. I also work for RSCAN as the regional manager. And, uh, and I'm associated with an Australian company that represents uh, Tracy Technologies, which is a, a, a quite cool device. So in um, over my years, I've been involved with a series of companies and uh, I have uh, some expertise with uh, some of them, you know, without actually with all of them. <laughs> and um, my financial disclosures today are with uh, Meridian, Arscan, Tracy Technology and Ophthalmologic. Those are, those are companies that I'm, I'm associated with within and directly and directly. So that's, um, that's it, so that's me. Now, getting into business, the learning objectives of, to, of tonight um, is to um, explain a little bit what is ultrasound. From the photographer point of view, from someone that does imaging, from someone that is uh, taking uh, images all day, this is not a course for uh, ultrasonographers. Uh, I mean, if you're if you if you're watching this and you're one of them, just please stay there, enjoy the ride, and um, it's um, there will be things that's going to probably make your life easier, especially when you're training a new a new technician. Uh, the idea is to demonstrate how useful is UVM when using it against different and current technologies like OCTs and cameras. So this is something that you guys will, um, I'm going to, to work on the comparison of many of these ones through a, a series of photos and, and, and clinical examples, okay? The agenda is going to be easy. The agenda will be um, to explain basically the, the, the ultrasound, the frequencies of the ultrasounds using ophthalmology, uh, some techniques and annotations, how we, how the ultrasound, ultrasound specialists do it. And, um, why inside 100? I mean, what is what it is? What is it? Uh, what makes sense for someone that is doing imagings uh, all the time? And uh, some some brief cases to explain the use of ultrasound technology in oncology, uh, evaluating the anterior segment or anterior retina 
uh, glaucoma refractive. So, well, without much more introduction, the ultrasound has three main applications, okay? The first one is cleaning. It's usually used heat and high power. Um, it is a uh, low frequency. Um, this is kind of um, ultrasonic cleaners as when you go to the optical shop and they put your, your glasses in, in a pond of soap and it starts to vibrate. Those are sort of ultrasound um, cleaning devices. Uh, thera uh, therapeutic, when generates heat, this is, this is uh, also a low frequency one. This is when you go to the physio and you have a pain and they put an ultrasound in your, in your arm because you have tennis elbow or so much golf you guys are playing instead of being in lockdown, joke. Um, but um, the main, the, and the most important one is the use of uh, ultrasound as a diagnostic tool. And this is what it competes us for tonight. Um, you, I mean, those, uh, woman that has been pregnant, um, then um, you will, you know, you have experienced probably, you know, the, the use of ultrasound and seeing the inside of your body through a, a an incredible devices. Well, we have, it's, um, and these ones are usually, you know, really low power in the microwatts and uh, a huge amount of, of uh, frequency, you know, we have, anyone from one to a hundred um, millihertz, um, megahertz. This is basically the biggest, the larger the amount of hertz you're using, the least amount of uh, penetration you're going to have. So in the eye, you're going to have a higher ultrasound compared to the lower uh, frequency that you're going to use to, to check a uh, um, baby. So, what is ultrasound again is the um, frequencies larger than 20 kilohertz. I mean, 20,000 cycles per second cannot be uh, here listened by humans, perceived by humans. It's something that dolphins, whales, uses to communicate to each other because these sort of waves will travel really good around the water or in the, in the water. So it is an excellent uh, it is an excellent organ. One second, just get good. I'm recording. Uh, this is an excellent. The eye is an excellent organ, a, an excellent medium to be to use the ultrasound because it's full. It, it's a fluid. Uh, it, it's filled. It's filled with fluid. It's filled with the aqueous in the anterior segment and vitreous in the back. That means that the ultrasound waves will travel back and forth and will be able to see any sort of a structure inside of the eye. When the posterior segment cannot be visualized in the opaque ocular media, when uh, you, you when you cannot see something, you use ultrasound. When there, there is something occluding the light, you use ultrasound. So this is you know when you're going to document the global architecture, anything that if the light doesn't go in, you can. So some examples when you have colon infection, when you have scarring, when you have a mature cataracts opacified capsules, you know, glaucoma, hypopion, hyphema, constricted pupil, I mean, detachment, hemorrhage. But when you have some trauma, I mean, there is a, a lot of different um, reasons why you're going to be using um, ultrasound in the eye. So um, bear with me, we're going to be, ultrasound is, um, there's two types of people, those ones that are uh, love ultrasound, and those are the geeky, geeky ones, and those are found absolutely boring. Uh, I was in the second, in the second uh, group until I found um, this technology because it's so cool that it's, uh, I re it reminds me of my, my early days in 2005 when the OCT was starting to come. So this is a great, it's a great device. In ophthalmology, we, we use several, um, what, um, uh, frequencies. So when you use 10 megahertz, it's a biometry, it's a, it's a linear, um, linear, and it's called A scan because of their amplitude. And you can see here the amplitude. So it's measure the amplitude of the different echoes. Those echoes are produced every time that they, the, the sound wave found something and then produces an echo. So when the sound wave travels and find the cornea, 
then you have one echo and then you have the um, epithelium and then you have the endothelium you can see there well then you have anterior segment posterior segment uh, retina and sclera <coughs> sorry and uh, that is what you can see on an a scan and this measure is a because of amplitude so on the uh, on the b scan b for brightness you have it's like a series of scans all of those uh, imagine that the the taller the A scan is, the brighter is, the, the shallower it is, the less bright it is. And that's what you've seen. So this is what you've seen on the back, on the posterior, and this is what you've seen in the anterior uh, UBM. So there are different um, type of wavelengths, or oh, sorry, sound waves or frequencies used. Then you have 10, 15, and 20 megahertz uh, to, to check the globe and to evaluate the globe and the whole orbit. So you can see tumors behind the sclera, you can see anything in the eye, you can see a parasite, as you can see there. I mean, there is many, many things. When you use, for the corneal posterior lens, you use um, um, frequencies of 20, 35, 40, and 50 megahertz, and then a really, really high megahertz to which to, to evaluate the cornea. Again, the higher the megahertz, the more resolution, the lower the megahertz, less, reso uh, uh, less resolution, the higher the megahertz, you are going to have less penetration, and uh, the lower the megahertz, you will have higher penetration, okay? So there are a couple of different ultrasounds, and then you have the robotic one. The robotic one, there is only one, it's us. Awesome. It's our scan, the inside 100 is the only robotic ultrasound. And then you have those manuals. I mean, those ones that they are handheld, which is all the rest. And those are probably, you know, the leaders of the regular world of ultrasound. I have no fear of talking about this one. I'm going to show you really, really cool images uh, achieved by different ultrasounds. Basically, I have images here for Quantel, for Alex, and I believe for Sonoma, and you have, and those are the main ones that I have here, you know. Um, now, in terms of technique, the ultrasound to it's user dependent. So any, except us, any ultrasound, any regular ultrasound depends on the operator. It depends, it requires the operator to be really an expert to get really good images. Uh, they have to be trained, and uh, the images depends on their skills. Every single image needs requires an annotation. So that means you need to tell the, you need to annotate and you need to know how did you put the, the probe? Did you put it in an axial way, which is center with the, with the crystal lens, with the optic nerve on the back in the center? It is longi longitudinal. That means it's an image like this, where the probe points to the pupil and the image, the, the, the tail of the, or the bottom of the scan is going to be always showing the optic nerve head. Uh, is it transverse when it's neither longitudinal or, uh, or actual, but this transverse is on the side and you can do it, you know, lateral, um, or, or, or horizontal or vertical, you know, and uh, all of them needs to be annotated where is it superior, is it inferior, is nasal, temporal, or is just, I mean, what clock hour you're using. You need to fill the eye with uh, the cup with a, a silent solution. You need to use either, um, either that or the, you know, regular, the clear scan shell. AKA, they call them the condom. Um, so ultrasound specialists are so great that they can have that image and tells you, yeah, that's an apple because we know it's an apple. I mean, that's, that, that, would be, that would be pretty much actually how good these are, these guys are. They're so good that in my taste or in my, in my level of skill set, I say that if I will be hiring an ultrasonographer, I would like to have someone that can fly a 747, um, drive a sonar for a ultrasound or, or submarine 
do a little bit of jogging, have a Steve Hawking as a friend, as a relative, and being okay to have the patient looking like the orange dog work. I mean, this is the kind of guy that we're looking for. Now, but what is the difference between any ultrasound and the ultrasound that our scan is talking today and what is the inside 100? So the inside 100, it is a UVM ultrasound indeed. It's, uh, it is unique. Indeed, it has a very high sampling image. I mean, this is something that we, the main difference we have is not the megahertz that we have, but is the amount of image that we can take per scan um, compared to the, to a normal uh, UBM scan, we produces, we produce higher image with higher, higher resolution. I mean, we have a reverse water bath, not the way that you can see on the screen of that patient with the orange block work in a way that the patient will submerge themselves in this machine and the machine will fill up with water, well, saline actually, not water, is going to fill up with saline solution and then that's why we call it a reverse water bath. It is totally robotic control, it's user independent, and uh, it is a multi this multidisciplinary tool. It, is, it's, it works for a lot of a lot of specialties within the, the tool. So this um, video here, while I'm talking and while I'll give you a little bit more information, shows how quick the patient the, the scan is being taken. Okay. So again. This very high frequency ultrasound is being acquired by a swept beam liquid interface technology. We have a probes inside of the unit that they are robotically controlled and they have a pupil tracking. As you can see there, you can see the radial lines. Those radial lines, as now as new OCTs, they have a pupil uh, detector, a pupil tracking, and it's going to follow the eye to assure a, low, uh, a better image um, taken. It is the, the, res ex the resolution is exceptional compared to any other ultrasound in the market. It is very, it's highly repeatability. It's excellent. And uh, the reproducibility, it is so good that it's not user dependent. You saw actually how fast it is. And uh, this, technolo this technology, it's a leap forward technology in the ultrasound instruments because it makes every person as good as, as those uh, excellent ultrasonographers. So this is, this is what, we, what we like to present it to you today. Now, um, as I said, this unit is so easy. As you probably remember, um, the top one, um, one of the old machines. This is this was in the in the uh, analogical time, and you probably remember the um, the Stratos OCT. And, and if the new guys, the young guys, don't remember that, those were the pioneers. I mean, not the top one. That, that top one was is probably what twenty years old. But the Stratos OCT was was the first OCT in the market in two thousand and four, three and four, uh, and. Our scan is as easy to use as any of those, those guys. Our scan is, uh, I mean, I don't know how easy it would be to use a smoker, uh, but, uh, but I will leave the smoker conversation for the next, for the, for the question, because I have some questions for the guys in Texas. If there is anyone from Texas, I need to learn how to use one of those. Okay, so comparing OCT and standard images or comparing ultrasound and OCTs, you can see that the ultrasound as, 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 a, as a general, it's, it has a lot of um, um, penetration, but it doesn't have a lot of um, fine detail. So the resolution is not that bad, that, that great, where the OCT does. Our scan, on the other hand, will give you both, will give you a lot of resolution up to one micron in the cornea, and it's going to give you the penetration that you can see up to the back of the eye. So it's a good compromise between OCTs and regular ultrasounds. I will always say that 
our images in our scan are very similar to a primitive OCT. And uh, I believe that's a compliment. <laughs> okay, so when we talk about repeatability, reliable and relevant, you can see studies done by um, Carol Lovinsolo, um, Carresi Soul, um, on comparison of different equipment and different technology, you know? And uh, the Artemis was around um, 0.13 of millimeters and 0.23 in the sulcus where the inside 100, which is better with better analysis and better um, board, we can, we have a repetibility of 0.12. So that's 120 microns. That, that's, that's very, very good compared to any other in the in the in the field now i would like to um to talk in a little bit more the different areas i mean just go, go a little bit of oncology anterior segment which is more anterior retina um glaucoma and refractive and i like to do a little bit of an analogy with different chefs because it's uh it gives you the idea i mean um jota motolenghi is the kind of guy that will take everyday dishes that are everyday ingredients that people are not used to prepare in a fancy way. And uh, this is exactly what we're going to do with oncology. This is things that we do every day that we think that that's it. I saw it, I saw melanoma, melanoma, melanoma. But when you see it through the UBM eyes, it's like having a dish from, uh, from Otolengi, you go like, oh, wow, this is absolutely fantastic. Now, this is what you guys can see. You know, you have the iris melanoma, you have different melanomas here, you have an nevus, and you used to see that. I mean, um, you've seen probably way more as a photographer, so you've seen way more photos of, of melanomas and nevuses uh, than, than me, and you're used to, used to take the images with the OCT. Now the question, the question is that can we can we really can we really measure? Can we really see the whole size of the tumor? Can we see their borders? Can we see the progression? Can we really see what is inside of that to differentiate if it's a melanoma or if it's a nevus? I mean, we can it's 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 interesting because we can see one or the other and we can have um, different perceptions. So when we add the the UBM factor, you can see how a, a melanoma looks so different than a nevus. You can see that inside of 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 a nevus is is, is totally different than inside of a melanoma. I mean, this is. These images have been taken by one of those gurus in the world that they are probably, you know, um, anyone that has that do ultrasound in the world knows who this guy is, uh, the Dr. De La Torre. Now, um, this is, this is uh, uh, another way to see, you can see OCTs, you can see uh, ultrasound, and it's, it's, it's a much better diagnosis and there will be ways to do it. Now, when you use our technique, you can see that um, Barry, the, our vice president of sales, who has no training, not, not, not really good as much as, as Dr. De La Torre, you can see how he can uh, take the images. You can see here, and this is the staff from Ron Silverman, uh, Dr. Ron Silverman, I should say, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, this is an old unit. This is called the Artemis, which is uh, the pre, uh, predecessor from the um, inside 100. This is the grandfather and this is the grandson. This is the current unit. This is the quality that we are looking at the moment. And look, you can see the borders. You can see the reflectivity. You can see you mean, uh, that, that it's encapsulated. You can see absolutely everything here. That, and that is the kind of the, the details that an OCT will not give you. For anterior segment, I mean, in terms of anterior retina, I mean, um, I would like to, you know, invite you to, to try any dish from Jamie Oliver. It's comfort food. It's something that is just 
fantastic having their, their carbonara or having any sort of, and I hope you guys are having a glass of wine with this presentation. I'm not because, well, I'm working. So, um, but um, you can see, you know, a normal um, cyst, you can see, uh, this is the Artemis before, this is the new unit. Uh, you can see cysts here and you can see how, how good these images are. The, these sort of images will allow you to identify problems, especially if you're doing fake IUS, if you're doing, uh, if, you, if you want to, you know, think, you know, well, this, this is an angle closure, what's happening here, you can see what it is. If there is, I mean, after um, glaucoma surgery, you can see that there is a separation in the cords and what's going on here. You cannot see that with a, with an OCT, you can only see it with a ultrasound. You can see, you know, something called diffusion. Now, when you evaluate in anterior uh, retinoschisis, you can see very, very well that the ultrasound is the way to go. I mean, this is, it's something that really makes a huge difference when you are evaluating anterior retina. That's a, you cannot see this with, with any other device in that, in that way. Now, normally when you um, evaluate anterior segment images, you have, you're used to that. You're used to see the OCT and you, and you I mean, pretty much we all seen it in some way or form. Um, this is a really good image from a UBM. This is a 40 megahertz uh, probe. Um, and this is great. I mean, and, and uh, those working in hospitals, you probably have have used one of these. This is an iCube. Um, it's been discontinued. Um, but in reality, what you see as a UBN image is something like this. It's, uh, I mean, you can see it, but it's not great. This is like a blur picture, you know? Um, look at the difference. This is taken again, maybe by Barry, maybe by Andy, maybe by someone else, someone maybe that wasn't trained in the art of, of the, uh, ultrasonography. You can see the level of details that you have here. It's more close to that than close to this or the other one. So the Inside 100 will give you the confidence of you don't have to be an expert to take the image. You only need to know where to take the image. And, that's, and you guys know that. So um, when, we, when we talk about glaucoma, you know, let me introduce you to Neil Perry. Um, if you guys, if any, if, if any of you guys comes to Sydney, we will go to Rockpool. Um, there is a couple of a Spice Temple, you know, really good, amazing meats and amazing uh, wines. There you go. And if you cannot drink wine, I'll drink it for you. So that's fantastic. But it's, it's, um, and the reason is that there is new, there are things new that is always inventing, always doing new things. And uh, this is what we're trying to, to do here in glaucoma. The evaluation of the angle with ultrasound is a different story. When you have your normal evaluation in OCT, you will see something like this. But what about if I tell you that sometimes when you see that, what you're really seeing is this. You are seeing this angle. And uh, well, the square spur is here. That means the angle is here, not there. And in a lot of cases, you're going to see the OCT being showing you this area rather than that area, because that's what it looks like an angle. Um, the ultrasound, and, and, and look at the image here compared to that. The ultrasound technology will show you square spur is going to give you the ciliary body. Um, sulcus is going to give you the iris angle recession, everything. You will have the zonules, you have everything. So this is something that for the study of glaucoma, it will give you a relevant information. Rele relevant as, is that an iris, um, an iris plateau or a pupillary block? On that photo, you don't know. And you don't know because the OCT will not give you more information behind um, the iris. 
In this case, you can see it perfectly. And you can see that it is, an, it is a force, it's, a, it's an iris plateau, but you have there a pupillary block because it's in contact the iris with the, um, with the uh, lens and uh, that's what's causing there. So usually, you know, you blew a hole there with a PI and uh, that's fine and it's fixed. Now, the angle closure, another angle closure with iris plateau and pupillary block. And in this case, you see it like that. I mean, you guys, it's the same as before, right? But then this is when you see the whole, what's happening in behind you can see the whole lens, just a massive lens moving anteriorly and growing. It's a phacomorphic uh, glaucoma that you will not fix with blowing a hole in the iris, aka um, um, peripheral um, iridotomy, they call IPLs. Um, in this case, you will need to do a um, extract the lens and do a cataract surgery. So you can see here again, um, another, uh, another cyst and the cyst is pushing and closing the angle here. So this is so easy that anyone can take those trade images with the um, inside 100 without being an expert. I would like to close with my favorite um, subject, which is refractive. And that's why I choose a little bit of sweet from Angela Lawson. And uh, she's the queen of chocolate, by the way. She probably would be the queen of many other things, but that's not my problem. She's, the recipes are absolutely great. Now, um, when we do, and I'm going to mainly talk about star surgical and the ICS. And the reason is that that's my expertise. There are other fake IULs. And uh, whatever I said about one, I probably will, will say about everyone because they are, they are similar in the way that they work. But the most critical factor to uh, check the, or to predict, uh, to select the size of the lens that you're going to implant is the one to one, and that's the sizing of the lens. And uh, when, when STAR was, um, did the trials during the FDA clinical trials, they selected surgical calipers to be their main um, method of, of measurement. Um, together with that, they use the orb scan. So if anyone knows an orb scan, well, you guys are old because none of the youngers will know what an orb scan is unless, unless there is one just lying around. Um, orb scan was a a very good topographer that used a slit illumination that is, it was similar like a chamfer, but it was uh, done with a slit. And um, it was made by Bausch and Lohm. Now, the, these two devices were the ones using, but the problem is that the, every year, every year during the um, STAR uh, meeting, the expert meeting during ESCRS, um, the European Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery in Europe, Every year, we have the same questions over and over again from every single doctor. Is there anything new to measure wide to wide to measure the size of the ICL? And there are only three ways to do it. I mean, you have the wide to wide, the other with caliper, topography, or optical biome or optical devices. That's it. Sulcus to sulcus, which is mainly um, UBM, and then you have angle to angle that you can do it either with OCT or with UBM. Um, the angle to angle is a predominant done with um, OCT because it is very, very hard to acquire the, uh, an angle with a good resolution using UBM. So except if you use, yes, there you go. You guess it, R scan. Okay, so, um, Parker did a meta-analysis meta of different methods and, and different papers of evaluating the, the vault and the method used. And he found that extreme vaults are a risk factor for adverse event, but not an adverse event itself. And uh, this is 
I mean, um, this was uh, published and, uh, and he was mainly talking about star surgical products. The adequate vault that they, he said that it would be adequate would be from 90 to 1,000. However, STAR has always said that the ideal vault is from 250 to 750 microns. And this is more important basically when you are using basically the lens that is being used or implanted in the United States that doesn't have the hole in the knee. And that is, uh, it's called the evil. So let's, let's focus on the lens with no hole because I believe that the majority of the uh, audience that comes from the US. Now, when you, when you do the, the measurement of wide to wide and the AC depth with different devices, there is a fudge factor and there is different um, variants depending on the use instrument that you that, that you like that, that you use so there is there is a little bit of variance when you use uh different units to do the a uh your chamber depth and there is a lot of the variance when you use the different units um to measure the white to white empirically speaking and this is empirical i haven't published anything i don't think i'm going to um we found that the IUL Master 500, the previous version of the IUL Master, um, it overestimates the sizing of the ice of the wide to wide by 0 0.4, and the IUL Master 700 by 0 0.6, and the lens star by 0 0.8. If you choose the lens star and you don't and you don't um, recalculate or use the fudge factor you're going to implant an ICL that is two sizes larger. What happens there? Bang, pupillary block, disaster, bad reputation for the doctor, lawsuit. I mean, you name it, you'll have it. It's, it won't, it will turn per shape. Um, disclosure, these numbers are mainly for my experience and it will not be used it shouldn't be used without consulting your star surgical person. Please, so just don't, don't get me in trouble. Thank you. Okay, we'll continue. So when you have those problems and when you have sizing, uh, sizing issues, you're going to have an oversized lens. You're going to have a closure angle glaucoma. You're going to have pupillary blocks. You're going to have, you're going to, you, you, you will see pigment dispersion. And the same problem happens when it goes the other way around that if it's too low or too shallow the vault, the lens is going to start to rub against the crystalline lens and it's going to produce anterior capsular cataract. In either way, it's just bad, okay? It's, it's a, at least the doctor is trained to, to fix the cataract and they can replace the lens, but that comes with a cost, with a problem. And, and imagine that this is a 20 year old boy or girl or whatever, that, 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 that would be bad. That would be really, really bad. Now. So making the measurements with the tools that most doctors have today sometimes feels like the aim that that archer had with uh, shooting those arrows in that, in that target. I mean, they are absolutely all over the place because using OCT, you can guessing where is the wide to wide. You know where the angle is, but you don't know where the sun, where the zonal are. You don't know where the cilia body is. You don't know where the sulcus. You cannot do. You shouldn't use an OCT to measure or to calculate ICLs ever. I mean, you can use it afterwards, but not before. When we use the inside 100 to calculate ICLs, it's a totally different story. We can measure absolutely everything. I mean, from corneal thickness to, to ciliary body, ciliary body, zonal plans, elevation from the zonal plans, elevation from the ciliary body, absolutely everything. Bang, bullseyes in the middle. This is absolutely um, a much better way to do it. Now, when you do a post-op uh, assessment with the inside 100, you really know where the foot plates are. You know where the lens rise is based on the on the ciliary body on the zonal sorry, on the sulcus sulcus to sulcus lens rise. 
and what is the volt, what is the true volt, you can measure all of those things there with the inside 100. It is difficult, not to say impossible, um, to measure uh, in either with the OCT, say, where are the foot plates? Are the foot plates in the right place? Are the foot plates bented? What's happening behind the iris? I mean, there are many things that we don't know. And you can see, you can see how the foot plates here are bented. This is a bent um, um, foot plate. And uh, you can see that one foot plate is one place and the other one is another place. So this is, they are in a different areas. And we can see that with the inside 100. Can you see it with a, with a handheld UBM? Whoa, I mean, that's uh, probably only in Peru, but, uh, but uh, it will be very, very few places that you can. That will be very, very difficult to do it. There are guys, very good guys in Poland, very good guys in France, very good guys in Mexico and, 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 and everywhere, but it's not easy. It's not easy for the regular um, technique, uh, technician just to do that. Um, um, believe me, I used to train them, so I know that there is not. Uh, so when we continue checking the post-op on, on an ICL, you, I mean, we have this doctor, you know, Roberto Saldivar, he's in Buenos Aires and in Mendoza, he's an expert in ICLs, and he's been doing ICLs since 1997, I hope I have no one that was born that year because that means that we're really, really old. But anyway, let's continue. Now, um, he, he says that the measurement of the peripheral volt is the one important, not the central volt. And he did a, a, a bunch of studies saying, you know, well, that's the ones that cause the cataracts. That's, the, that's, the, that's what we can measure. And um, in reality, the only way that we can repeatedly and reliably check over and over again over the same plane is with our scan. I mean, he has one, he uses it, he loves it, and uh, he measures the peripheral volt. And when he measures the peripheral volts over the six line radius of the ICL, you can see then that you have a thickness map. And you can see that there is very shallow this and very thick his area two different lenses, two different examples, just, just, this is just for the, for the explanation of the webinar. And you can create a map like that. I mean, the map will look like this without the ICL shape. We're working on that for, for a different version, but at the moment you get just that bow tie showing you where the ICL is um, its placing. Now, um, another pioneer, that has helped us, I won't say the another pioneer, the pioneer that has helped us to develop a lot of the things that the Inside 100 does today is uh, Dan Ryzen. Dan Ryzen was um, started to work with Carlos Lovisolo, who was doing a lot of work for the um, developing of a, of a formula to calculate the ICLs in a much better way. And uh, well, he found he found a way and they, 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 uh, these guys found a formula. So what they did was they took absolutely everything that you could measure in the eye, okay? Uh, the angles, the ACD, the angle to angle, the sulcus to sulcus, the sulcus to sulcus, lens rise, the zonal to zonal, zonal to zonal, uh, lens rise, and the ciliary body, ciliary body. They, they got everything. I mean, if, if it could be measured, they measured. And, uh, by regression, they, they um, took only those values that were um, relevant for the measurement of the, um, um, for, to determine the sizing of the ICA, I'm sorry. And um, so while others have recommended size, you know, like, yeah, you can do 12.6, 12.5, 13.2, whatever you want to do. And uh, they, one, while they do that, and you will get a, hopefully, an acceptable volt, in this case, remember 250 to 750, this would be a little bit higher than, than what I expected from STAR. What uh, London Vision did is, well, we're going to show you, we're going to give you 
a vault selection. You're not going to select the lens, you select the vault you want. So this is all great. I mean, it, this, is, this is the secret that every single ICL user, and I don't know if there is anyone uh, listening to me or if any of you guys are working with ICL implanters and refractive surgeries, but if you are, tell them about just to watch this, this webinar because now you can select what vault would you like to have in your patient. It's not about, oh my God, what lens should we use? No, 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 no. It's what vault should we use in that patient? Is a young patient that's have a high vault? If it's an old patient that's going to have a low vault, whatever you want to choose, you have the answer there. And we can provide that with 95% confidence interval. I mean, that is, that, that's a lot. Anyway, and um, another, another uses of the refractive application I'm, I'm about to finish. So, so please just, you know, breathe in, breathe out. Um, some of the other applications is evaluating the cornea. And these are really important because you can see 10 year old lazy flap. Remember these scans, as you see in there, we have one micron resolution. Um, you can see the uh, a um, post op smile. You can see the epithelium map and uh, uh, Reinstein. Dan Reinstein found Dr. Dan Reinstein or Professor Dan Reinstein uh, found that the epithelium has different maps. And when, when, the, when the cratoconic eyes are present and you scan the epithelium and you evaluate the epithelium, you can see different mapping. So on, the, on your left, you're going to see a normal epithelium. Circa in the bottom, um, thinner and the top, that's okay. But here is a cratoconus. Okay, so when you see the donut, you are going to see a cratoconus eye. So what they did is, you know, they, they, they did a lot of studies and they've do, they done a lot of studies over the years. And uh, they found out if they, they always in a keratoconus eye, the thickest point gets thicker and the thinnest point is thinner. And this is, this is in the progression of the keratoconus. Also, um, they developed the uh, Reinstein um, score for keratoconus. And uh, this is a normative database that analyzes the results against normal and, um, and abnormal eyes, and it will give you a greater brighter kindness. That means by doing that, you can instantly decide, am I going to do a corneal-based refractive surgery, or should I do something else, AKA a fake IOL, STAR, or any of the other ones, biotech, or, or I mean, it doesn't matter which one the doctor, that's that doctor's problem. Now, this is, this is really, really good because this is even more, uh, because you have one micro resolution is going to be even more specific than using Pentacam, Galilei, or any of the other guys. Now, not all units are built the same, but, <laughs> No, neither of the operators. So you have, this is, I mean, this could be the same operator, you know, that shocks, gives you that anterior segment image, you know, seriously, or that one. I mean, it's a little bit better. This one can be taken again, but the guy that you're going to meet in a second, and that will be our VP of sales, Barry, um, and Barry will, will, will take that image, or John, or Peter, or Karen or, or Sharon, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter who takes the image, it will always look that good. And that is the secret of the eyes, of the, of the eye scan. So if an expert UBM ultrasonographer is like a Funa, Funakoshi San, you know, that's the creator of Shokotan, um, Shotokan, the, the karate, uh, karate, the our scan factor makes this guy being a karate master equals than him. I mean, the image is an equalizer. 
And that's what we offer to you when you use the R-Scan. Um, my name is Rick Barings again. That's my um, email, rbarings at rscan.com. Has been a pleasure to introduce you to our technology. I'm really proud to be associated with R-Scan. And I'm sure that we can, that, that you will find that this as useful as I think it is, um, because it's going to give you much more information to your patients and your doctors. Thank you very much. And uh, well, let's the questions begin. Thank you.